only rock station. 105.1 FM. The Rock. To understand Guam, you first have to leap. The safety gear, uh, you do have to wear. It's slightly uncomfortable. Uh, when you get in the plane, it's not like your normal airliner. It's uh, much less comfortable and dark. We hitch a very damp ride, 300 kilometers out into the vast Pacific, where Pax Americana, the American peace, has reigned for more than half a century. The airplane will uh, touch down. You'll hear the hook hit the flight deck. We're about to land on the most potent symbol of American power. You're going from about 120 to zero in about a second and a half or two. Delivered into the strange, hazardous world of a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the USS John C. Stennis. There's purpose in this color-coded chaos. Red shirts load the missiles. Brown push the planes. And yellow calls the shots. It is extremely dangerous. We're working uh, a lot of aircraft in a small area. And uh, it's easy to get blown down by the jet exhaust or the prop wash or get sucked up by an intake. So there's a lot of things out there that you've got to be aware of. The ship has just ended a six-month deployment to the Gulf, launching missions into Afghanistan and Iraq. The 90,000-ton Stennis serves just one purpose to impose Washington's will through the power of its 68 combat aircraft. What does the US carrier symbolize when an American battle group shows up? This is a demonstration that the United States of America is present. And we're here uh, as a partner nation, an ally, a uh, an organization that is committed to seeing through our commitments to so st stability and security throughout the globe. No one on this carrier will openly discuss it, but the US is deeply concerned by events a few hours flying time over the horizon. China is undergoing a huge military modernization program challenging America's absolute control of these sea lanes. This year, the Pentagon warned the US Congress that China's rapid build-up was altering the military balance in East Asia, particularly in the flashpoints of Taiwan and Korea. America's response, this war game, codenamed Valiant Shield, bringing together the Stennis and two other aircraft carrier strike groups, 30 ships in all. And so when you see three carriers uh, together, what message are you trying to put across there? An amazing commitment, <laughs> because that's a lot of power. China take notice? I suspect so. Several decks below the bridge, 20-year-old Megan Saunders helps deliver Washington's show of strength. I joined when I was 17, and this is the only branch of military that my parents would sign for. On this high-tech ship, a surprising number of jobs still rely on old-fashioned muscle power. Megan Saunders says being one of 500 women on board makes life tougher, but there's little time for contemplation. We have to be better. We have to pull our weight. Did you see anything on this deployment that surprised you? Um, the amount of ordnance that we dropped, a lot. 
and the pilots come back with footage from the bombings when they go over to Iraq. You think about where the bombs are going at the other end? Yeah, it's kind of scary though. It's, I don't know. I don't want anybody to get hurt, like innocent people to get hurt, but it's kind of cool. 105.1 FM. Even aircraft carriers eventually head for port. And that's why Guam matters. With the world preoccupied by Iraq and Afghanistan, Washington is quietly preparing to transform this sleepy backwater into a 21st century fortress at a cost of 16 billion US dollars. Well, to tell you the truth, this is the largest, uh, I should say, move or transfer of forces uh, in, dollar-wise in the history of, of the military. And if you look at the US, this is the edge. So as they say in Guam, this is where America's day begins, and this is where our defense begins. But I think that's still got to be looked at. I think Navy Captain Bob Lee has the job of selling the build-up to the world. He says there'll be new facilities for nuclear submarines and a permanent aircraft carrier base, all to be built on the third of the island controlled by the military. 8,000 U.S. Marines are coming from the Japanese island of Okinawa. Japan's government contributing six billion U.S. dollars for the move. Here we're closer to, you know, the Pacific Rim. We have countries to the you know, you China to Thailand to anywhere over here where you can get there two to three days by ship and two to three, four hours by air. Guam's airbase is packed with aircraft here for the war games. Soon they'll return on a more permanent basis. Construction has already begun. Eventually, 15,000 workers will arrive to build Fortress Guam. In one sense, Guam has seen it all before. After recapturing the island from the Japanese during the Second World War, American aircraft took off from these same runways to bomb Japan. During the Vietnam War, these now aging B-52 bombers launched their relentless air campaign from here. Now, it's all happening again. Well, currently we have about 14,000 uh, Department of Defense uh, members here. That's military and family. We expect around 40,000 uh, around the year 2014. So this is a massive uh, increase. It's about 25% of the audience population. So we're very aware of the social impacts this can have and, and in our planning process, we're considering all that. Now, right over here, we have displays of ships that are important to the history of the island. This is a the most accurate model in the world of Magellan's Victoria. History professor Dirk Ballendorf says the Spanish first stepped ashore here nearly 500 years ago. But the Spanish established a colony precisely because of Guam's strategic importance. And the Americans took possession in 1898, and apart from a few years of Japanese occupation, have been here ever since. Certainly China's military posture and the, the money that China spends on its military is a concern to our military leaders, uh, correctly so, because they're spending apparently on a, an offensive type military and they are becoming very large. Guam is a slice of middle America in the Pacific. 170,000 people living on an island two-thirds the size of Singapore. Guamanians are a blend of the original indigenous people, the Chamorro, plus Filipinos, Mexicans and mainland Americans. The 
other islands of Micronesia are sovereign. They have their sovereignty. Guam doesn't. Why not? Why won't the United States relinquish sovereignty here? Well, it's too uh, strategically and militarily important. This is a very important piece of real estate. And while Guamanians are US citizens, they can't vote in American presidential elections. If you want to define not being able to vote for president as being second class, and many do, then, they, then we are second class citizens. Despite widespread resentment over their status, the islanders are fiercely patriotic. Nearly everyone here has been in the military or is related to someone who has. Now, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. And they've borne more than their share of losses. Twelve have died in the Middle East, with dozens more wounded, suffering casualties ten times higher than the national average. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Twenty-two-year-old Jesse Castro was killed in Iraq last December. Every week, his widow Teresa leads family prayers in the carport. You know, he was really good at assuring me he's, everything would be okay. And I guess we never really knew the extent of how bad it really was out there. We have one son, um, Jesse Jr. He was born November 21st. Baby J was 12 days old when Jesse passed away. So he never got the chance to see him. He heard him on the phone. He would call often so that he could hear the baby. And he made sure he would call me when when I was in the delivery room and stuff like that, so he was really good. He called as often as, often as he could. The war in Iraq had already started when Jesse Castro joined the army in 2003. I think a lot of it has to do with the way of them getting off the island and exploring the world, so um, a lot of them also joined to support their families, um, support their children and their wives, and it's, I guess it's kind of like a, a way to get out. Oh my gosh. Despite her loss, Teresa Castro joins the majority of Guamanians in supporting the build-up. I think it's good for Guam's economy. It helps boost up a lot of jobs and uh, opportunities for families here to make money as well. She doesn't want her son to join the military when he grows up, but accepts it's the destiny of so many of Guam's young men. You know, it's sad that his dad's not going to be around to help raise him, but... You know, his sister, Jesse's sister, his mom, his aunts, his uncles, his cousins, my sisters, brothers, you know, they're all here for us. Typhoons, earthquakes, and centuries of colonization have erased most, but not all symbols of the indigenous Chamorro culture. They are a pillar of a Lati hut. Rumbo Benevente, is an activist with the Chamorro Nation movement. He says these giant latte stones were the foundations of ancient Chamorro buildings. You put it on, you anchor the hut, so when there is a portion of earthquake, yeah. it somehow just uh, work itself out like a... Earthquake proof. Yes. Rumbo claims a third of the islanders are ethnic Chamorro. As a former soldier, he isn't calling for independence or for the military to be expelled. He just wants to be consulted. They're the colonizer. We're being colonized, and that uh, you know, trying to survive here, and you know, to me, we could survive with the United States or any country in this island as long as they have respect towards the indigenous people. The military aren't the only visitors to Guam. Less than four hours flying time from Tokyo. The island is a haven for Japanese tourists. We have to make sure that we don't forget where we came from. Any remaining vestiges of Chamorro culture are being swept away. Burial sites and latte stones displaced for hotel rooms. The latte stone actually a long time ago, they were all over this place, yeah. about probably a quarter of a mile in and, and so on. And uh, right now, when they're, where, what they're digging up, there is a lot of remains, probably 2,000 years old. <laughs> 
few on the island, apart from the activists, are complaining. At night, the tourist strip transforms into a Pacific Islands theme park, complete with imported Tahitian dances, upmarket duty-free shopping and Elvis. Come and join us, this is Sam Choi. Seafood restaurant. After the military, tourism has been the island's biggest earner, generating 35% of the economy, providing 20,000 jobs. But there's been a slump in visitor numbers, and many locals believe the military will be their economic salvation. Out on the Stennis, there's a colour and movement of a very different kind. Uh, yes, right now we are going to San Francisco. In the Combat Direction Centre, the eyes of the ship reach far over the horizon with the aid of surveillance satellites. They've tracked an uninvited player in the war games. The Russians have sent two nuclear bombers on an epic 13-hour flight to Guam. It's the first such mission since the end of the Cold War. Because the Admiral wants to know what they're seeing. But the Americans tell us none of this at the time. Nor do they reveal that military confrontations with China are becoming increasingly common. You know, when the pilots take off from these carriers, they fly over near the border, near the Chinese border, and they tell me, say, oh, the Chinese always come up to meet us. I mean, we're always playing these little cat and mouse games up there, every time. So there's, uh, you know, for those, those people that are involved on the front lines of this, that's a very serious thing. I'm sure our pilots, they're going to confront these Chinese pilots, and they're very, very thoughtful about that and I think the Chinese pilots <laughs> are equally thoughtful but that's happening all the time. Even those supporting the build-up worry that their island may become a greater target in a new Cold War. Their fears only heightened by news that Guam will soon host a missile defence shield, capable of destroying targets 120 kilometres out into space. The Ballistic Missile Defence Group, they're, they're building the new system, uh, so it's called a theatre high air altitude defence. It's one of those that uh, when something happens you won't know it because it's way out in space. Uh, so it's just another missile defence and it's not just for Guam, it's, it's a regional thing. Now they say don't worry about it, people of Guam will protect you. What if there's about hundreds of uh, nuclears that are coming over here? Would you stop all of them at once? Or you probably miss. And remember, one nuclear bomb probably wipe out the northern side of the, the whole island. Washington faces a tough battle in winning local hearts and minds. Confusion over the military's intentions has led to the first congressional hearings on the island since the 1970s. Because I served for 31 years, and this is what I get paid. Rumbo is here, but prefers to leave the heckling to his more vocal Chamorro Nation comrades. Captain Lee, whose last big job was running the military's community relations in Baghdad, finds himself accused of stage managing the event. You need to respect the Chamorro people. Yes, sir. But yet you have just also said that the decision has been made by the Japanese government and the US government, and this is going to happen no matter what we say. Well, they've made an agreement on the relocation. And that's right. Important. They, they, they've made an agreement. All right. But we're all Americans. So this is useless. <laughs> I, no, no, no. American citizenship was shut down by throat. Don't, don't say that to me. Many of our own sons and daughters have served and continue to serve proudly and honorably in the United States Armed Forces today. Inside, debate over the tip of the spear is more measured. 
as local politicians and bureaucrats talk through the implications. United States Marine Corps and the Navy... Democrat Congresswoman Madeleine Bordalio is Guam's representative on the panel. She puts you in the middle, right? She's cute enough. All right. Just as Guam residents can't elect the president, Madeleine Bordalio has no real vote, only observer status in Congress. Well, overall... But this doesn't dampen her enthusiasm for the military's plans. I am very optimistic about this build-up. Uh, Guam, uh, you know, our economy is suffering and uh, we do have the tourism industry, but we need additional revenues in, you know, to provide services for our growing community. While America's army has been exhausted by the long Iraq conflict, the powerful Navy and Air Force, having played only a secondary role there, remain fresh and motivated. And it's these men and women who'll be pivotal in any confrontation in the Pacific. America's strategy on Guam is about deterrence. Preparing for war to prevent a war. And while no serving officer mentions China by name, the message is clear. We're the United States and we're a powerful force no matter where we are. Uh, we're investing in Guam, we're investing in the United States to come back here. And uh, it's, it's no secret that the United States can let people know that we're proud of who we are and uh, take, a look at, take a look at us. Perhaps more than most Americans, the people of Guam understand history and the sacrifice of war. He was buried here at Veterans Cemetery. Um, it's really nice where he's buried because he's up on top of the hill. He overlooks the whole cemetery. They've sent their fathers, husbands and sons to fight and die in foreign lands. Some of the others that passed away along, um, not too long after Jesse, there are four of them in the same area, so it's really nice. They're all together. Now they stand by the flag as fiercely loyal Americans, while quietly praying their island home doesn't become a battlefield in the 21st century.